135. Let's get to Scream 2, which came out in 1997. It is once again directed by Wes Craven. Stars basically the same cast, but also adds Liev Schreiber, Timothy Oliphant, uh, and a few other faces who would really go on to have pretty big careers. So it's cool to see them in this. And the synopsis is, two years after the first series of murders, as Sydney acclimates to college life, someone donning the ghost face costume begins a new string of killings. So I only saw this one right after I saw the first one. I was like, all right, cool, I'm hooked now. And I went and saw, I think, the whole franchise up until whenever that was, all the way through, like in a night. And I was very, very pleased that this one did not have a huge dip as many sequels do when it comes to horror slashers. And I don't think it's a perfect movie. I don't think it's as good as five or six, but it's still, to me, a very, very solid entry and a very solid sequel. And there's not a lot of the meta stuff. There is still some of that. And I like the conversation with the college classroom and them mentioning how sequels don't really work and all that. And I think that conversation, even though it's a little like, all right, you know, we get it. I think it's still pretty clever. And I could see a film class having that kind of conversation. So it works because I've even had that sort of conversation with my film friends. So I like that. And one thing that this franchise does really well and that sets itself apart from things like Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw, Halloween, etc., is that it is pretty much a different killer every single time. Whereas, you know, it's Michael Myers in all of Halloween. No matter how many times we think he's dead or how many times he gets stabbed or shot, he still comes back. And in this, it's like, well, typically the killers are killed at the end. And then someone else says, well, I'll go get a costume of Ghostface and I'll be the killer this time. So I think that's very clever. And that allows you to have endless amounts of ideas without making it seem that unbelievable. Because you could easily see nowadays someone, oh, well, the character up from this or this killer is dead. I'm just going to go buy the costume I can get at Walmart and do the same thing, you know? And so it's not really that unrealistic of a situation. So that's something I really, really like. And you only really see that once you go through the franchise as opposed to just having watched one. And the multiple killers as well, I think, is a very good idea and pretty much works every time. I never really get bored of how they reveal those characters who ends up being like it's never I think part three spoilers probably the weakest but we'll get to that besides that I think that carrying through with Nev Campbell's character I really like her I really like Courtney Cox and that set of friends I guess they're not always friends in the context of the story but that gang of characters and David Arquette I think how they bounce off of each other and trust each other and then they don't and etc cetera, etc cetera. I think that is very effective for the most part and there's really talking about this being a sequel to a slasher or it being a slasher sequel while it's not a masterpiece there aren't that many flaws to it I find like it's obviously not as original as the first but pretty much one of the only issues if we're talking about this within the context of the franchise within the context of the genre I mean, performances are fine. There's nothing amazing, but they do the job. It's directed well. Wes Craven has a very good... One thing I do love about him, having gone through all these movies, is he has the ability, especially in the first one, but really in all of them, he has the ability to make simple moments, simple visuals, very memorable and very creepy, very weird. And like simple deaths or the look of someone's wounds on their body like he just has the ability to make it very iconic and chilling and pretty much one of the only issues is I think it's maybe a touch too long it's two hours it's a little bit longer than the first and I think it could have maybe been cut by 10 or 15 minutes but I think the third act is great in the theater the chase with Courtney Cox and David Arquette especially with Courtney Cox through those rooms and through the hallways and she's trying to sneak around the different parts of the room and the walls and I think all that is very very suspenseful and it really looks good and I love how they show both Ghostface and her creeping around different areas and all that I think it's very well done and then also another thing that this series does well I don't want to get too repetitive but there's just a lot that I love and if I have the chance to talk about it I will 
I like how they set up the idea, and especially nowadays, it makes sense because of how easy, I guess you could say it is, to frame someone or to suspect someone or suspect the worst in someone. I like how they have the incorporation of seemingly innocent characters, like who gets the blame for the actual killer, and like, all right, well, is he actually the killer? Is he not? And then friends saying, no, I didn't do it, and then they actually did do it or they didn't, and there's that constant suspicion of people and i think as the series goes on and it's especially in five and six where you could really post something about someone take it out of context and well that person looks like a villain now they're crazy they're whatever so i really think that this series has a lot more there's nothing incredibly deep but i think it has a lot going on that i didn't really notice on first viewings that sticks with me and i really enjoy thinking about that and I enjoy that very gray area of those characters and who you should follow, who you shouldn't, you know, who knows what. So besides that, the sequence at the beginning with the very meta meta situation with the two or with a couple where they're going to see the stab movie and then the girlfriend gets stabbed by ghost face while watching the movie and then she goes up on stage and is obviously like wailing in pain but then people think it's like a publicity stunt because they're right in the middle of a violent scene and I think all of those ideas it's you could maybe not everybody loves it but I do I think I really appreciate that now and I enjoy it more and more every time as I learn more about the series and as I go back and revisit all of them so that opening is iconic and that's another great moment that they parody in the scary movies, the parody films. I like the sequence with the phone call in the park at the college, and they're not sure who's calling because they're being watched and them running around trying to tackle anyone who's on the phone. I think that's pretty enjoyable. And the sorority sequence as well with the blonde girl. But one thing, though, that always gets me, and maybe this movie set the stage for it, I don't know, but it sort of annoys me on a very personal level a very unimportant level where this very stereotypical girl is watching the silent original version of Nosferatu. Completely ridiculous. Never in a million years would that ever be believable. And I don't understand why, like I understand they want to put in classic movies and have more of the meta, like, oh, they're watching a slasher or a horror movie while the killer's in the house and whatever. I get that. But I feel like they could put on something a little bit more believable as to what they would actually be watching. And I think they do the same thing in It Follows, where she's watching, like, I think maybe the original Frankenstein or something along those lines, where I just don't believe that those characters would ever take the time to watch that. I mean, pretty much me or any other film, not maybe, but even that is a stretch, but definitely not a very stereotypical sorority sort of college person. No way. And maybe I'm crazy for saying that, but I think that's pretty accurate. So I, that doesn't take anything away from the movie itself, but it sort of bugs me on a nitpick level. But I think that whole sequence where she is thrown out the window is very effective. So again, I don't really have a lot of big things to say or to point out that it's, you know, that are wrong or bad. I think it's just a very good, engaging, effective, entertaining sequel that I think should get more praise than it does. And I think really all of these movies should be getting more praise than they do, but they come across as very, which I mean, maybe you could call them as just shallow slashers, but there's a lot more going on and there's a lot more creativity than I think people realize. At least that's what I get from it. Maybe I'm in the minority there, but I've always kind of felt that having gone through these movies, especially if I watch them one after another, which I easily can do. So. Highly recommend it. Not one that I would really rewatch by itself. It's still a very good movie, but I think I would only typically watch two, three, and four if I just watched one. Whereas I think five and six I can watch by themselves, but I think even with those, I want to start with five and then watch six. So I think that they sort of go together in a kind of interesting way where usually I can watch one offs in all of these franchises, but in this one, I really want to start from the beginning and just enjoy all six movies to date. So I think that's pretty impressive in its own right. But 
yeah, that one is a heavy four and a half out of five.